Welcome. Today we are going on to chapter two in Soren Kierkegaard's Philosophical Fragments. Uh, title of this chapter is The God as the Teacher and Savior. And this is a poetical venture. As we mentioned last time, we have the basic framework on how Soren Kierkegaard's Johannes Climacus believes that we can address that question of can the truth be learned if we're looking at things from a non-Socratic position. At this point, we're taking a sort of poetical venture. We're, we're taking a different sort of perspective in moving forward and addressing this. He starts off in chapter two, stating, let us briefly consider Socrates, who was indeed also a teacher. He was born in a specific situation, was educated among his own people, and when at more mature age, he felt a call and a prompting, he began to teach others in his own way. Having lived for some time as Socrates, he presented himself when the time seemed suitable as the teacher Socrates. Himself influenced by circumstances, he in turn exerted an influence upon them. In accomplishing his task, he satisfied the claims within himself just as much as he satisfied the claims other people might have on him. Understood in this way, and this was indeed the Socratic understanding, the teacher stands in a reciprocal relation in as much as life and its situations are the occasion for him to become a teacher. And he in turn is the occasion for others to learn something. Right? That Again, the idea, even though we're not going to be really using the term teacher and learner from the Socratic position, the notion of the occasion for this exchange is what the teacher is doing from the Socratic position. Continuing on, his relation, therefore, is at all times marked by autopathy, just as much as by sympathy concern for the self as well as concern for the others, right? Because again, it's this sort of reciprocal relationship where I, as a, a man from the Socratic point of view, as was mentioned before, have self-knowledge and the self-knowledge is a little bit of God knowledge because the understanding of the God being eternal, etc., would apply to the self as well from the Socratic point of view. And the same happens to be the case for you that we have this, again, reciprocal relationship. This was also the way Socrates understood it, and therefore he refused to accept honor or honorific appointments or money for his teaching, because he formed his judgments with the unbribability of one who is dead. The idea here is that I'm not doing anything, therefore I can't receive any pay. Personally, I think I'm helping you guys out a lot, so I want that pay. But you know, that's a different sort of that's a difference between me and Socrates. That's a different sort of idea that you and I have a different reciprocal relationship. I started my venture into doing this at a different point in my life and financial stability than Socrates did in his life and financial responsibility. And therefore we have different expectations and outcomes. But that same sort of impulse of Really why I do this is not for the pay, but for the ideas that you will learn. This is the same sort of idea that what Socrates was trying to do, that there's value in this sort of reciprocal relationship. And that has real tangible value to the teacher as well as the learner. And therefore everything else changes it. it it now moves this into an exchange that may or may not be beneficial it might be a commoditization of my talent instead of it just being an open engagement we can kind of definitely look at the notions of marx as applied to this idea of should you refuse the honorarium should you refuse the money uh, because what does this do to the exchange what does it do to the value it simply makes it into a commodity now, we might not want to agree with Marx and take it, everything else to that full extent, and, and definitely we would have disagreement between Kierkegaard and Marx, but we can kind of see this sort of idea being exemplified by Socrates. What rare contentment, how rare today, when no amount of money could be large enough and no laurels splendid enough to be sufficient reward for the gloriousness of teaching. 
Yeah. Well, we would like some stuff as, as educators, right? But all the world's gold and honors are the express reward for teaching, since they are equal in value. But what of our age, after all? As the positive and is a connoisseur of it, whereas Socrates lacked the positive. But notice whether this lack explains his narrowness, which presumably was grounded in being zealous for what is human and in his disciplining of himself in that same divine jealousy, which he disciplined others of which he loved the divine. Top of page 24, second line down. Between one human being and the other, this is the highest. The pupil is the occasion for the teacher to understand himself. The teacher is the occasion for the pupil to understand himself. In death, the teacher leaves no claim upon the pupil's soul, no more than the pupil can claim that the teacher owes him something. So generally speaking, broadly speaking, we are uh, humans, we are equal. We might be the occasion for somebody to learn and to even understand themselves. But I owe nothing to you upon death and you owe nothing to me upon death. You might say you really enjoyed the class, that it helped you understand you, that it even might have contributed to you in some sort of fundamental way. And that would be fantastic, that would be great. But it doesn't automatically mean that I get something on you, that you know, you're know you now in my eternal debt or service. No, the exchange is done, the pay has been given, Sufficient or insufficient for the task that becomes its own larger discussion, but essentially there's been this exchange and and now we're even that both of us had a mutual encounter and thus a mutual benefit from this. Continuing on. And if I were a Plato in my infatuation, and if while hearing Socrates, my heart pounded as violently as Alcibiades more violently than a Corybantis. And if that passion of my admiration could not be appeased without embracing that glorious man, then Socrates would no doubt smile at me and say, my dear fellow, you certainly are a deceitful lover, for you want to idolize me because of my wisdom. And then you yourself want to be the one person who understands me best and the one from who admiringly embrace I would be unable to tear away. Are you not really a seducer? And if I refused to understand him, his cold irony would presumably bring me to despair, just as he explained that he owed me just as much as I owed him. Right? This becomes the nice sort of exchange, again, that we owe each other something. And even if you're gonna become fanatical and, and zealous of this time, the, there's nothing else that can be given because again from the Socratic that we are the occasion for one another. It's very nice to hear some of the other language that Kierkegaard uses in some of his other works. His notion of the seducer here is very much just kind of pointing out his other work either or and this idea of the different spheres of existence right the ethical um, versus the aesthetic and that the seducer is kind of in the aesthetic and what we see even here very subtly is this sort of push and urge on to that ethical sphere instead of the aesthetic sphere of what we would find uh, from either or. So a little, you know, little breadcrumbs over there to mentioning some of his other works is fantastic. How rare in this age, he continues, which everyone goes on further than Socrates, both in assessing one's own value and in benefiting the pupil, as well as in socializing soulfully and in finding voluptuous pleasure in the hot compress of admi uh, admiration. And we, we all want to say, oh yeah, this is great, but we like this idea of admiration that it's going to say that there is a little bit of ego that's wrapped up a little bit more with us than it is oftentimes with Socrates. What rare loyalty, seducing no one, not even the one who employs all the arts of seduction to be seduced. Bottom paragraph on 24. But the God needs no pupil in order to understand himself. 
and no occasion can act upon him in such a way that there is just as much in the occasion as in the resolution. Again, now if we're going to move from the Socratic to the non-Socratic, instead of everything being equal, instead of the teacher and the learner being the occasions for one another, if the non-Socratic, the God, is the teacher, well, the God doesn't need the learner for this occasion. This has a different significance, and therefore different weights and obligations are needed. What then moves him to make his appearance? He must move himself and continue to be what Aristotle says of him. Unmoved, he moves all. And we have the same thing echoed with Aquinas and his proofs for the existence of God, right? But if he moves himself, then there is, of course, no need that moves him, as if he himself could not endure silence, but was compelled to burst in his speech. But if he moves himself and is not moved by need, what moves him? but love. For love does not have the satisfaction of need outside of itself, but within. Now, this is a very interesting sort of notion of, of love. It's at least thought-provoking. The motivation for love is not something from outside, because at that point, it's not love. It's greed, avarice, envy, uh, a desire to control, or, or something else that love has to have its satisfaction within itself, that it's reciprocated, it's given, it's controlled, and the value of love is in the loving. His resolution, top of 25, which does not have an equal reciprocal relation to the occasion, must be from eternity. Even though fulfilled in time, it expressly becomes the moment again, that term once again, for where the occasion and what is occasioned correspond equally, as equally as the reply to the shout in the desert. The moment does not appear, but is swallowed by recollection into its eternity. The moment emerges precisely in relation to the eternal resolution, to the unequal occasion. If this is not the case, then we return to the Socratic and do not have the God or the eternal resolution or the moment. And again, it has to be this unequal occasion where one is giving fully, the other is receiving, and then the debt is owed to the other end. Again, this, this sort of dialectic between what's being presented on one side and then the counterpoint. We have this and then we have that. And again, it's, it's very much could almost read like Anselm, right? Who would be like this? Even that guy says. And instead, what we have here with Socrates is Johannes Climacus is, right, here's the Socratic. Well, here's another idea. Well, if we're not, we're going to have to go back to this, right? We have this sort of either or one side or the other, this dialogue, even though it's all being done by the same individual, uh, being the way this is delivered. First full paragraph down on 25. Out of love, therefore, the God must be eternally resolved in this way. But just as his love is the basis, so also must love be the goal. For it would, indeed, be a contradiction for the God to have a basis of movement and the goal that do not correspond to this. Right? What does this mean about omnipotence if your goal and your resolution and your actions don't all line up, right? The love, then, must be for the learner, and the goal must be to win him. For only in love is the different made equal, and only in equality or in unity is their understanding. So, because we're learning, what we're seeking after is understanding. And the only way we can understand is for this to be an unequal relationship where somebody possesses the knowledge and the other person can get that. But the only way for us to make up that difference is to be made equal. And what's being pointed out here is that what's going to help perfect understanding is love because the aim of love is equality. You can't love somebody and say, but I'm way better than, than them in every respect. Well, you might get groups of people who kind of half-heartedly joke about this, that's not truly 
love if they actually believe it. Without perfect understanding, the teacher is not the God, unless the basic reason is to be sought in the learner who rejected what was made possible for him. Yet this love is basically unhappy, for they are very unequal in what seems so easy, namely that the God must be able to make himself understood. It is not so easy if he is not to destroy that which is different. But we have this, this tough part to address here. If I'm trying to make unequal things equal, how do I not destroy the differences? How is it that there's value given to both parties? How can equality be achieved if indeed I'm not just destroying you to make you into me? And of course, there, there's some of this that's done in human relationships. There's the loss of an old nature to take on a new nature, but then there's still that loss. And how can that be brought in without destroying the other if we're talking about such a transition between not to be to to be? We shall not be in a hurry. And even though some may think that we are wasting time instead of arriving at a decision, our consolation is that it still does not therefore follow that our efforts are wasted. Once again, we're not rushing through this. We're going to try to analyze this and, and see if we agree with the conclusions of it. We're going to tease them out and see if they're valid or not, and if this is the way we should proceed. There's another kind of unhappy love, he's going to say, that there's, there's a host of these. The love which we speak, to which there is no perfect earthly analogy, but which we nevertheless, by speaking loosely for a while, can imagine an earthly setting. The unhappiness is the result not of the lovers being unable to have each other, but in their being unable to understand each other. This is a fairly common issue in a lot of relationships. Right? There, there, there's love, there's the joining of lives together, but it's hard and oftentimes people fight over the fact that I don't understand you. You're different than me, right? Our lives grew up different. And while I might love you and you might love me, we might still not even be able to understand what makes you tick? Why are you why are you thinking this way? Why are you engaging this way, right? Even in marriages, this is the case. And it takes a long time when one person says, all right, I'll deal with your crazies. Um, I'll accept that. I'll accept you for who you are, even though I don't get it because I had a different life. And you will do the same for me, ideally. The unhappiness is, right, the not being able to understand each other. And this sorrow at the end of 25 is indeed infinitely deeper than the sorrow of which people speak. For this unhappiness aims at the heart of love and wounds for eternity, unlike that other happy, unhappiness, which affects only the external and temporal, and which for the high-minded is only something of a jest about the lovers, not getting each other in time. At the end of that paragraph on 26, it is identified essentially only when the God, because no human situation can provide a valid analogy, even though we shall suggest one here in order to awaken our mind and understanding of the divine. We have this different sort of relationship here um, where we're trying to make equal out of a situation that's unequal. And how does this work without loss? How do we do this and have understanding? So here on page 26, we begin this example on trying to see how this love can be made. Suppose, he says after the break on 26, there was a king who loved a maiden of lowly station in life. But the reader may already have lost patience when he hears that our analogy begins like a fairy tale and is not at all systematic. You know, again, we're, we're borrowing some fruitful sort of language, some, some colorful language. Remember, this is the poetical venture. So it's not going to be as systematic as some others. And he says, essentially, don't lose out on this. Well, presumably, uh, the erudite Polos found it boring that Socrates continually talked about food and drink and physicians and all such silly things Polos never talked about, uh, as we read in Gorgias. But did not Socrates still have advantage that he himself and everyone else had a prerequisite knowledge from childhood on? 
And would it not be desirable for me to be able to stick to food and drink, something far beyond my capa uh, capability? And I have no need to draw on kings whose thoughts provided are kingly and are not always to be like everyone else's? Again, moving on of saying, you know, while you might have lost interest, Socrates kind of did the same thing. And so it's not uncharacteristic that we're going to make these sort of similarities. Suppose then that there was a king who loved a maiden of lowly station in life. The king's heart was unsustained by the wisdom unattained with the difficulties that the understanding uncovers in order to trap the heart and that give the poets enough to do and to make their magic formulas necessary. His resolution was easy to carry out, for every politician feared his wrath and dared not even to hint at anything. Every foreign country trembled before his power and dared not to refrain from sending its congratulatory delegation to the wedding. And no cringing courtier groveling before him dared to hurt his feelings, lest his own head be crushed. So let the heart be tuned, let the poet's song begin. Let all the festive, uh, while erotic love celebrate its triumph, for erotic love is jubilant when it unites equal and equal, and is triumphant when it makes equal in erotic love that which was unequal. 27. Then a concern awakened in the king's soul. All right, here's this king that he madly loves this maiden. They're completely of unequal status, yet no one will point it out to him. Where is this concern going to come about? Where is the, the jubilation of this love really going to be known? It has to be awakened in the king's soul. Who but a king who thinks royally would dream of such a thing? He did not speak to anyone about his concern. For if he had done so, any one of his courtiers would presumably have said, Your Majesty, you're doing the girl a favor for which she can never in her life thank you adequately. But there's this difference between this king and the maiden. And he says, of course, everyone would just say, you're fantastic, because they're out of fear, right? No doubt the courtier would arouse the king's wrath so that the king would have to have him executed for high treason against his beloved and thereby would cause the king another kind of sorrow. Alone, he grappled with the sorrow in his heart. Whether the girl would be made happy by this, whether she would acquire the blood of uh, bold confidence never to remember what the king only wished to forget that he was the king and she had been a lowly maiden right this fact will always exist in this relationship that they are unequal even though the goal of love is to make equal for if this happened if the recollection awakened and at times like a favored rival, took her mind away from the king, lured it into the enclosing reserve of secret sorrow, or at times it walked past her soul as death walks across the grave, what would be the gloriousness of erotic love then? Then she would indeed have been happier if she had remained in obscurity, loved by one in a position of equality, contented in the humble hut, but boldly confident in her love and cheerfully early, uh, and late, right? So this becomes the difficulty. The king truly loves the maiden and wants the maiden to love him. But of course, the maiden, knowing this unequality, will never truly be happy in this relationship because there's always this forefront of knowledge that they are terribly unequal. And she would be much happier indeed not marrying a king and getting all of the opulence of that, but marrying somebody of a similar sort of social standing who was her equal. The, the, the problem of, of dating out of your league, right? What rich overabundance and sorrow stands here as if ripe, almost bending under the weight of its fertility, only awaiting the time of harvest when the thought of the king will thresh all the seeds of concern out of it. For even if the girl were satisfied to become nothing, that could not satisfy the king, simply because he loved her, because it would be far harder for him to have her be her benefactor than to lose her. She can't be nothing, and he can't just simply give her everything. 
that those are not real relationship. It's not real equality. It's not real love at that point. And what if she could not even understand him? Or what if there's this difficulty and they're approaching anything because they see things differently? For if we're going to speak loosely about human, we may as well assume an intellectual difference that makes understanding impossible. What a depth of sorrow slumbers in this unhappy erotic love. Who dares to arouse it? Yet a human being will not suffer this, for we shall refer him to Socrates, or to that which is still more beautiful, since is capable of making unequals equal. First paragraph on 28. Now, if the moment is to have decisive significance, and without this, once again, we return to the Socratic, even though we think we are going further, the learner is in untruth. Indeed, is there that is through their own fault. This is the basic formula on how we need to see things. And yet he is the object of the God's love. The God wants to be his teacher and the God's concern is to bring about equality because this is what love is. If this cannot be brought about, the love becomes unhappy and the instruction becomes meaningless for they are unable to understand each other. We probably think that this may be a matter of indifference to the God, since he doesn't have need of the learner. But we forget, or rather, alas, we demonstrate how far we are from understanding him. We forget that he does indeed love the learner, right? With this idea of love being there and necessary because of just the beginning of the condition, this notion of unequality, and the goal is to teach, and that teaching has to take place because of that deficit that the only way of doing this is love so because we have to have love that is going to transform how we're going to address this and just as that royal sorrow is found only in a royal soul and most human languages do not name it at all likewise all human language is so self-loving that it is no imitation of such sorrow but the god has kept it to himself this unfathomable sorrow because he knows that he can learn, uh, that he can push the learner away, can do without him, and the learner has incurred utter loss through his own fault, and that he can let him sink, and he knows how nearly impossible it is to maintain the learner's bold confidence, without which understanding the equality disappear, and the love is unhappy. Anyone who does not have at least the intimation of this sorrow is a lumpish soul with as much character as a small coin bearing the image neither of Caesar nor of God. But we have this sort of foolishness uh, that's there if we don't fully understand that there will be sorrow involved and that something has to overcome this difference for love to be true. So we need to make the learner and the God, the king and the maiden, equal, even though they are, by their very nature, unequal, and for the sake of the non-Socratic position about learning, it is essential that they are different, that they are unequal. So there's two possible avenues of this, and we're given the first one here on page 29. The unity is brought about by an ascent. The God would then draw the learner up towards himself, exalt him, divert him with joy lasting a thousand years. Let the learner forget the under misunderstanding of the tumult of joy. Yes, the learner would perhaps be very much inclined to consider himself blissfully happy because of this. And would it not be glorious suddenly to score a great success because of the God's eye fell upon him, just as it would be for the lowly maiden? Would it not be glorious for that of the assistance of him? and taking the whole thing in vain, deceived by his own heart. That noble king, however, already saw through the difficulty. He was something of a connoisseur of human nature, and saw that the girl would be essentially deceived. And one is most terribly deceived when one does not even suspect it, but remains as if spellbound by a change of costume. Right, so option one is to, to bring up 
to elevate the lowly and just establish it. Now you are now, you know, exalted. But he's pointing out that this is an act of deception, really, to do so. And an act that includes even accepting a self-deception, that you can't just glorify to make equal. That's no different than just putting on a robe doesn't actually make you royalty. The unity could be brought about by the gods appearing to the learner, accepting his adoration and thereby making him forget himself. If the god just shows up and says, I am the font of wisdom, I am truth, it's possible that you're just completely lost in that and you dissolve yourself in this. Likewise, the king could appear before the lowly maiden in all his splendor, could have let the sun of his glory rise over the hut, shine on the spot where he appeared to her, let her forget herself in adoration and in admiration. This perhaps would have satisfied the girl, but it could not satisfy the king, for he did not want his own glorification, but the girl's. And his sorrow would be very grievous because she would not understand him. But for him, it would still be more grievous to deceive her. And we have this idea that, oh, you're going to lose yourself. And maybe even the learner could be satisfied with that. But the teacher could not be. Because, again, there's wanting to be this relationship out of love and not simply the disintegration of the other. Bottom of 29. In taking this path then, love does not become happy. Well, perhaps the learner and the maiden's love would seem to be happy, but not the teachers and the kings whom no delusion can satisfy. The God doesn't uh, have joy in uh, adorning the lily more glorious than Solomon. But if understanding uh, were at all plausible here, it certainly would be tragic delusion on the part of the lily if, in observing the costume, it considered itself to be the beloved because of the costume. Down about five lines. There was a people who had a good understanding of the divine. This people believed to see that God was death, who grasped the contradiction of this sorrow, not to disclose itself in the death of love, to disclose itself in the death of the beloved, the human mind so often apprises, aspires to uh, might and power, and in its constant preoccupation with the thought, as if achieving, it would transfigure everything. It does not suspect that there is not only joy in heaven, but sorrow also. How grievous is it to have to deny the learner that to which it aspires with its whole soul, and to have to deny it precisely because he is the beloved. So the first option really just is death. It's loss, it's disintegration. The learner loses who the learner is in order to be in the relationship with the teacher. And this might even work for the learner. After all, they're glorified, but they're not really who they were. There, there's a form of death. Now, this might be important for the not to be to do be discussion. But again, is there real equality after that? And is this going to be satisfying for the teacher? It's a possibility, but it might not be the more satisfying option for the teacher, for the god, for the king. So if this option isn't satisfying, to the teacher, there should be another option, another possibility that would make the learner and the teacher satisfied, that would satisfy both the god and the man, the king and the maiden. And this is where we get into to be on page 30. Therefore, the unity must be brought about in some other way. Here we are once again mindful of Socrates, for what else was ignorance, but the unitive expression of love for the learner. But, as we have seen, this unity was also the truth. If, however, the moment is to have decisive significance, then this is certainly not the truth, for the learner owes the teacher everything. Just as the teacher's love, Socratically understood, 
would be only a deceiver's love if he let the pupil go on thinking that he actually owed him something, whereas the teacher was supposed to assist him to become sufficient unto himself. So the God's love, if he wants to be a teacher, must not only be an assisting love, but also a procreative love by which he gives birth to the learner, or, as we have called him, one born again, meaning the transition from not to do be to to be. The truth, then, is that the learner owes him everything. But what that which makes understanding so difficult is precisely this, that he becomes nothing and yet is not annihilated, that he owes him everything and yet becomes boldly confident that he understands the truth, but the truth makes him free. That he grasps the guilt of untruth, and then again, bold confidence triumphs in the truth. But when one human being and another, to be assistants, is supreme, but to beget is reserved for the God, whose love is procreative. Right. This is the idea of what real love is, is that that doesn't just make something, it, 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 it creates something. It has a has children, there's offspring of this love, right? But not that procreative love of which Socrates knew how to speak so beautifully on a festive occasion. Such a love does not mark the relation of the teacher to the pupil, but the relationship relation of the autodactic to the beautiful, as he, ignoring dispersed beauty, envisions beauty by and by itself and now gives birth to many beautiful and glorious discourses and thoughts. Continuing on at the end of that uh, paragraph on page 31, he has the condition therefore within himself and the bringing forth the birth is only an appearing of what was present. And that is what we hear of again, the birth, the moment is instantly swallowed by recollection. It is clear that the person who is born by dying away more and more can less and less be said to be born, since he is only reminded more and more clearly that he exists, and the person who in turn gives birth to expression of the beauty does not give them birth, but allows the beautiful within him to give them birth by itself. So we have this idea of being born by dying more and more there's there's a loss and a creation at the same time this is the notion of transformation if then the unity could not be brought about by an ascent as in the case with a right then it must be attempted by a descent let the learner be x and this x must also include the lowliest for if even socrates did not keep company solely with brilliant minds, how could the God make a distinctions? In order for unity to be affected, the God must become like this one. The king must become low like the maiden. He will appear, therefore, as the equal of the lowliest of persons. But the lowliest of all is the one who must serve others. Consequently, the God will appear in the form of a servant. But this form of a servant is not something put on like the king's plebeian coat, cloak, top of 32, which just by flapping open would betray the king. It is not something put on like the light of Socratic summer cloak, which although woven from nothing, yet is concealing and revealing, but is its true form. For this is the boundless love that in earnestness and truth and not in jest it wills to be the equal to the beloved. And it is the omnipotence of resolving love to the capable, of which is neither the king nor Socrates was capable, which is why their assumed characters were still of a kind of decent, uh, a deceit, sorry. And this is the problem, right? If the king puts on a plebeian co cloak, just pretends to be a servant, uh, that that's, a sort of deceit still. For this God, there must be uh, this new idea of becoming the low, because even if Socrates would deal with 
you know, the common tanner. So the God must instruct even the lowliest of all, which are servants, is the idea here of, of what Kierkegaard's Climacuses are arguing. Continue on after the break in 32. Look, there he stands, the God. Where? There. Can you not see him? He is the God, and yet he has no place where he can lay his head, and does not dare to turn to any person, lest the person be offended at him. He is the God, and yet he walks more uh, circumspectly than if the angels were carrying him, not to be kept from stumbling, but so that he may not tread in the dust the people who are offended at him. He is the God, and yet his eyes rest with concern on the human race. For the individual's tender shoot can be crushed as readily as a blade of grass. Such a life, sheer love and sheer sorrow, to want to express the unity of love and not to uh, be understood, to be obliged to fear for everyone's predictions, yet in this way truly to be able to save one single person, sheer sorrow, while his days and hours are to be filled with sorrow of the learner, who entrusts him to him. Thus does the God stand upon the earth, like unto the lowliest through his omnipotent love. He knows that the learner is untruth. What if he made a mistake? What if he became weary and lost his bold confidence? Oh, to sustain heaven and earth by an omnipotent. Let there be, and then if it were to be absent for one fraction of a second, to have everything collapse, how easily this could be compared with the bearing of possibility of the offense of the human race when out of love one became its savior. Again, very nice poetic distinction here in discussion as uh, this chapter indicates its aim is. But the form of the servant is not something that is put on. Therefore, the God must suffer all things, endure all things, be tired in all things, tried in all things, hunger in the desert, thirst in agonies, be forsaken in death, absolutely the equal of the lowliest of human beings. Look, behold the man. The suffering of death is not his suffering, but his whole life is a story of suffering. And it is a love that suffers, a love that gives all, and is itself destitute. But this is the this is the, the second option here. If it's not to elevate where the learner becomes death, then the teacher has to make themselves low to become equal with the pupil. For this point, the lowliest of all pupils. They need to be that low, which means there must be real suffering engaged in this servitude. That it can't just be something put on, but it has to be something lived and known. And here the teacher can truly then become the occasion for the learner to move from not to be to to be, from untruth to truth. Continuing on on the first major paragraph of 33. For love, any other revelation would be a deception, because either it would first have to have accomplished a change in the learner, love, however, does not change the beloved, but changes itself, he says here, and conceal from that which is needed, or in superficiality, it would have to remain ignorant that the whole understanding between them was a delusion. This is the untruth of paganism, he says. For the God's love, any other revelation would be a deception. Right? So there must be a real, true love of, for this God, for the fount of truth, for the untruth, and it has to take on this quality of lowliness. Continuing on at the bottom of 33 and on to 34, but the form of the servant was not something put on. Right, this becomes something inter in, internal to the nature of this teacher. And therefore, he must expire in death and in turn leave the earth. Down about four or five lines. Nevertheless, if I pleaded with him to spare himself and remain, I no doubt would see that him grieved unto death but grieved also for me because this suffering must be for my benefit. And his sorrow would also be that of my sorrow that I could understand him. Oh, bitter cup, he says that this is a, a bitter sort of consolation. Uh, down to the 
bottom paragraph on 34. And the learner, he has he no share of this part in the story of the suffering, even though his lot is not that to be the teacher. Yet it has to be this way. And it is love that gives rise to all this suffering, precisely because the God is not zealous for himself, but in love wants to be equal of the most lowly of the lowly. Right? This is not something that the learner has to do. This is something the teacher has to do. The teacher has to humble themselves to be able to be on equal footing, to make equal with the learner. This is not an action that the learner does, but that of the teacher. When an oak nut is planted in the clay pot, the pot breaks. When new wine is poured into old leather bottles, they burst. What happens then when the God plants himself in the frailty of human being, if he does not become a new person and a new vessel? But this becoming, how difficult it really is, and how difficult a birth. And the situation of the understanding in this frailty, how close it is at every moment to the border of misunderstanding. Uh, when the anxieties of guilt disturb the peace of love. And the situation of understanding, how terrifying, for it is indeed less terrifying to fall upon one's face while the mountains tremble at the God's voice than to sit with him as his equal. And yet the God's concern is precisely to sit this way. There is this idea of things not fitting in. And so there's this new creation that's going to be taking place because there's a transformation that takes place uh, for the teacher to be on equal footing with the learner. And therefore, a similar transformation will take place from the learner in the act of learning. Continuing on on page 35, about halfway down. And was this perhaps why you called my plagiarism the shabbiest ever, because I did not steal from any one person but robbed the human race? And although I am just a single human being, indeed, even a shabby thief, arrogantly pretending to be the whole human race? If that is the case, then if I went around to every single human being, and everyone certainly knew about it, but everyone also knew that he had not composed it, am I to draw a conclusion that consequently the human race composed it? Would this not be odd? For if the whole human race had composed it, might well, very well be expressed in saying that each and every person was equally close to having composed it. But we have the same sort of discussion here as we had at the end of the last chapter of where does this idea come from? Where is it being judged? How is it that you should pass judgment on Kierkegaard for saying, if you're drawing similarities to other events, uh, that's fine, but I'm doing this out of logic and concern, not out of some other preconception of trying to prove a different point. Uh, that again, this is a thought project of trying to understand what would have to be the conditions for something to be non-Socratic. And even if it looks like I'm plagiarizing something, even shabbily, so be it that this might be the where it is. Top of 36. I have robbed the deity, or to speak, kidnapped him, and although I am only a single human being, indeed, even a shabby thief, blasphemously pretend to be the god. Now, my dear fellow, I quite understand you, and understand that your anger is justified. But then my soul is also gripped with new amazement. Indeed, it is filled with adoration for it. Certainly would have been odd uh, if this had been a human poem. Down farther. This thought did not arise in my heart and finds it to be the most wondrously beautiful thought. The whole thing, wondrous, does not, in this word, come to my lips, uh, felicitously foreshadowing word. For do we not know, I, in fact, that you and yourselves involuntarily say, stand here before the wonder? We have this wonder that's going to be introduced at this point, at the very end of chapter two. And since we both are now standing before this wonder, whose solemn silence cannot be disturbed by human wrangling about what is mine and what is yours, whose awe-inspiring words indefinitely drown out human quarreling about mine and thine. Forgive me of my curious mistaken notion that had been composed it myself. It was a mistaken notion that the poem was so different from every other human poem at all 
but the wonder, right? So we have this new sort of way of trying to look at everything in this poetic sort of sense, but in it, we've learned that the teacher has to not annihilate the learner because then the teacher won't be satisfied, but that requires a emptying of themselves. And it has to be a real emptying because otherwise it's not real, uh, which might mean notions of suffering are attached with it. And that to do so, we're brought in this notion at the very end of, on page 36, at the very end of chapter two, that it's gonna cause wonder, that our approach at it will be one of wonder. And in the subsequent chapters, we'll see another approach at, at trying to figure out what it is to approach the truth, if it's not something from the Socratic position. And even if this one happens to look a little plagiarized or the fairy tale seems a little convenient or, or something, he says, you know, that's just kind of the nature of the way the work works and so be it. Uh, again, we have this same sort of idea. Maybe the story belongs to humanity and not simply to, to his thought experiment, but maybe that's why his thought experiment has it because it belongs to humanity, that there's some other great value that can be attached to it. So this concludes chapter two.